I want to begin by mashing together Abraham Lincoln and Joe Biden. Doing that, we might say, we are now engaged in a great uncivil war, testing whether this nation can long endure. One front in that war concerns the issue of slavery. One army marches under the banner of 1619. That is the claim that slavery is the defining and dominating feature of American history and its constitutional order. The other army marches under the banner of 1776, claiming that the American Revolution and the Declaration of Independence preeminently define America. In some sense, this is a new war because the 1619 and the 1776 forces as now constituted seem to have been products of the Trump era. But in reality, these two armies are merely the present day embodiments of a much older conflict. Now, one manifestation of that older conflict occurred in 1987, which was the year of the bicentennial of the constitution. In that year, Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall gave a bicentennial talk at that hotbed of constitutional studies, the San Francisco Patent and Trademark Law Association's annual seminar, which happened to be held in Maui, Hawaii. Now, rather than joining in the celebration of the founders that was occurring nationwide that year, Justice Marshall announced right off in his talk in Hawaii that he did not, this is a quote, find the wisdom, foresight, and sense of justice exhibited by the framers particularly profound. Now, the issue that led Justice Marshall to that dissenting view was slavery. Now, many people thought it was a little bit indelicate for Justice Marshall to raise this awkward question at a time of great national celebration of the Constitution. But nonetheless, the issue of slavery in the Constitution had been much on the minds of historians, constitutional scholars, and many other thoughtful citizens for quite a long time by then. Among the professionals, the ruminations about slavery had produced two factions or schools of thought about slavery in the Constitution, one sometimes known as Neo-Lincolnian and the other sometimes known as Neo-Garrisonian. The latter is named, you may know, for William Lloyd Garrison, a great abolitionist, activist, and thinker who had condemned the Constitution as a covenant with death and an agreement with hell because of its support for slavery. The other group, of course, was named for Abraham Lincoln, who had a somewhat different view of the Constitution. But 1619 and 1776 are the names of these two factions today. This is not the place to relate in any kind of detail the character of the debates between these two different groups, but a brief summary will be useful. Two main issues, I believe, separate them. One is how favorable was the Constitution that was produced in 1787, how favorable was it to slavery? And second, what were the motives upon which the founding generation acted when they acted with regard to slavery? The Neo-Garrisonians answered the first question by saying that the constitution was very favorable to the institution of slavery, that the constitution gave slavery a great deal of life-sustaining aid including recognition of its moral legitimacy. To them, the Constitution was indeed an immoral compromise. The Neo-Lincolnians, while conceding that the Constitution did indeed contain some accommodations to slavery, deny that these were nearly as substantial as the Neo-Garrisonians claim. They particularly deny that the Constitution stamped the institution of slavery with some kind of recognition of moral legitimacy. The second question about motives, the Neo-Garrisonians answer that the motives behind the actions of the framers were pretty much those same, that same complex of motives that led to the establishment and thriving of slavery in the first place. Greed, racism, Christian triumphalism, and moral indifference. The Neo-Lincolnians, on the other hand, emphasize that slavery was an inheritance of the past and its place in the constitutional order was mainly due to the press of necessity. They argue that without these concessions to slavery, the union could not have been made. And so to them, the constitution was a moral or at least a necessary compromise. 
the neo-Lincolnians frequently point to the connection to the to, in this connection, I should say, to the expectation, or at least the hope, among many of the founders, that the process of abolition begun in the states after the revolution would continue until slavery had vanished from the land. Now, the scholarly debates on the place of slavery in the Constitution can be very heated. The topic is so controversial that the parties cannot even agree on how many parts of the Constitution are relevant to slavery. One neo garrisonian who I happen to know, found in the Constitution 18 clauses, 18, directly or indirectly supportive of slavery. The neo-Lincolnians find far fewer. The three-fifths clause for representation and taxation, the slave trade clause, and the fugitive slave clause. Now, since these clauses are important for my talk, I'm going to pause a moment and give you a quick idea of what's in them. The formulas for representation and direct taxes provided, provide that each state would have seats in the House of Representatives in proportion to the number of, quote, free persons in the state. And then they use the phrase three-fifths of all other persons. Now, all other persons in this context is a roundabout way of, slaying, of saying the enslaved persons. All free persons count for one and all enslaved persons count for three-fifths. So far as there would be direct taxes, these also would be apportioned according to that same formula. The slave states would in effect get some representation for their slaves, but they would also be liable for more taxes for that very same reason. It turns out that direct taxes were not levied, and so this formula turned out to be a plus for the southern states and not really uh, uh, they didn't have to pay a penalty for it. The other, another clause, the slave trade clause, denied Congress the power to prohibit the slave trade until 1808. That would be 20 years from the ratification of the Constitution. And finally, the, sla the fugitive slave clause provided again in very roundabout language that a slave escaping from one state into another would not become free by virtue of having done that, but would instead be delivered up, as the language the text says. Now, for the rest of my talk, what I would like to do is go beyond the neo-Garrisonian, neo-Lincolnian battle and put forward a somewhat different account of slavery in the convention and in the constitution. I want to begin though by saying a bit about the context of slavery at the time of the Constitutional Convention, because I think both Neo-Lincolnians and Neo-Garrisonians go astray by not taking sufficiently seriously that context. Now, the historical circumstances in place at the time of the convention were very different from the subsequent history of slavery in America. Therefore, that subsequent history does not form an adequate basis for thinking about the expectations of the people who wrote the Constitution. But when we today, and this includes historians, when we think back to the problem of slavery at the convention, we too often think of it as if that history that subsequently unfolded was the history that they foresaw or expected or experienced, but it was not. Now, paradoxically, perhaps, Achieving clarity on the history that occurred after the adoption of the Constitution is most important for accurately, accurately understanding our topic. This post history, the history afterward, involved a real transformation of the slavery system. In the period around the time of the Constitutional Convention, the main use of slave labor in America was to produce tobacco in the Upper South and rice and indigo in the Lower South. But starting in the 1790s, the Southern economy shifted to cotton. And that shift to cotton was fueled by two technological advances. In the first place, there was the development of steam powered machinery, which led to the development of a mechanized textile industry in Britain, which led to the production of cheaper cotton cloth, which led to a rising demand for raw cotton. The second big technological breakthrough was the very famous cotton gin. This cotton gin was particularly important 
in driving the transformation of the Southern economy because the kind of cotton that could be grown readily in the American South was a kind in which the fibers of the cotton and the seeds of the cotton were very difficult to separate. The cotton gin made it possible to do this separ uh, separation cheaply and relatively easily. So with the cotton gin, cotton became an economically viable crop for the South. And with the ever increasing demand for raw cotton, it became an economically lucrative crop indeed. The difference that cotton production made after the Constitutional Convention is readily visible in a few simple statistics. In 1790, about the time of the Constitutional Convention, the United States produced 3,000 bales of cotton, 3,000. In 20 years, that figure increased sixfold to 18,000 bales of cotton, roughly. And by 1858, just about the time of the outbreak of the Civil War, cotton production stood at 4 million bales of cotton. So from the time of the convention to the Civil War, cotton production went from 3,000 to 4 million bales, more than a thousand fold increase. Cotton became the leading American export and the dollar value of cotton was greater than that of all other American exports combined. Now that the slave system that produced this cotton, which was so economically profitable, should be transformed by this immense growth in the cotton industry is not a matter for surprise. And that the slave system should become larger and more important and more entrenched, that also should be relatively easy to see. But we cannot read back from the history of what did happen to cotton and thus to slavery in that post-1790 world to the expectations and plans of the men who wrote the Constitution. That future, which we all see so clearly, was completely opaque and unexpected for them. Instead, they look back on a history and traject trajectory of slavery in America that was quite different. The history and trajectory before 1787. Now, of course, it's well known that by 1787, mid 18th century really, slavery was well established on the American continent. All 13 colonies at the time of the revolution had slavery. Slavery existed in French America and slavery existed in Spanish America. In 1750, according to the best estimates, about 20% of the population of what would become the United States was black, most of whom were enslaved. But this population was very unevenly distributed. In the North, less than 5% of the population was black. In the South, on average, 40%, with a high of 60% in South Carolina. The situation of slavery, however, was much affected by the American Revolution and its aftermath. There was a combination of events and trends that actually set slavery back in those years. One cause of this was that the British during the war offered freedom to slaves in the South who would come and fight on their side, and there were quite a few who took them up on that offer. Moreover, there were many others who took advantage of wartime chaos to flee from slavery. Beyond that, in a moment, the one important historian has called the contagion of liberty, all the Northern states, all of the Northern states moved to abolish slavery in the years after the revolution. Moreover, voluntary individual manumission was occurring and state laws were passed even in the South making such manumission more easy. In 1787, Congress, under the Articles of Confederation, passed the Northwest Ordinance, prohibiting slavery in the Northwest Territory, which includes the present states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin, quite a large swath of land, I'd say. Now, all of these developments produced an increase in the number of free Blacks, both North and South. In 1790, it's estimated that about 8% of all Blacks in the U.S. were free. By 1810, 14% were free. 
the number of slaves was conversely affected with the number dropping. Now, these few facts should make it clear that the world the men at the Constitutional Convention faced in 1787 was not the world that the nation faced in the 1850s. These facts should make clear that the trajectory of slavery in 1787 was not the trajectory that led to the entrenching of slavery in the 19th century. To understand slavery at the convention, we must look at it with their eyes and not with our eyes, either enriched as our eyes are or clouded by our knowledge of that subsequent history. Okay, so as I, as I said earlier, the two main ways of looking at this topic are the Neo-Lincolnian and the Neo-Garrisonian. I'm going to propose a third, the Neo-Madisonian approach, which is named for James Madison, who, in my opinion, was the person at the time of the founding who understood the Constitution best. I see the Neo-Madisonian position as a kind of middle ground between the Neo-Lincolnians and the Neo-Garrisonians, although not the kind of middle ground that merely splits the difference between them. One of the ways in which it's a kind of middle ground is that the Neo-Madisonian view holds the Constitution to be neither pro-slavery, as the Neo-Garrisonians say, nor quite anti-slavery in the way the Neo-Lincolnians say. The Neo-Madisonian position denies that the Constitution endorses the institution of slavery as legitimate and right, but it also denies that the Constitution made provisions to stamp out slavery, or as Lincoln put it, that it consigned the institution to ultimate extinction. Rather, the Neo-Madisonian position says a few things somewhat more subtle than these, three things in particular. First, first, it affirms that slavery is legal, but not legitimate. Second, it postpones or defers any disposition of the issue of slavery. And third, it does so for reasons deep in the fundamental character of the Constitution, so deep as to make it nearly inevitable that slavery was, was treated just as it was. Now I'm gonna take up those three points in turn. First, about legality and legitimacy. It is undeniable that slavery is in some sense legal under the Constitution. It existed in many of the states at the time of the framing. It allows the continued importation of slaves for 20 years, and it provides for the recapturing of fugitive slaves. These are all ways in which the legal existence of slavery is recognized. But the document itself is very careful not to endorse the institution that it recognizes. The constitutional clauses that touch on slavery are all written in such a way as to establish unequivocally that slavery is an institution existing under the states and not under the constitution's authority or with its blessing. The fugitive slave clause, for instance, speaks of, here's a quote, persons held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof. That is the constitution says forcefully that slavery is institu an institution under the laws of the state, not under its laws. The slave trade clause is parallel. It speaks of the importation of such persons as any of the existing states shall think proper to admit. So the slave trade is a trade of and by the states engaging in it and not of the government formed by the constitution. Moreover, as has been frequently noted, the words slave, slavery, and the like do not appear in the constitution, nor are there any racial references to be found there. In fact, the first mention of the word slave or slavery in the Constitution is in the 13th Amendment, abolishing it. Instead of speaking of slaves directly, the Constitution uses these awkward and wordy circumlocutions to refer to the slaves. It speaks of persons held to service or labor or such persons as the think states shall think proper to admit. If you were parachuted down from Mars and read this, you would have no idea what this was all about. Now, avoidance of the word slave and slavery and the like was altogether deliberate and intentional. At the convention, it was stated explicitly that such words should not appear in the document as they would be a blemish on a system aiming overall 
to secure liberty. Moreover, when the Constitution does refer to slaves, it un invariably refers to them as persons. So far as the law of the Constitution is concerned, the slaves are persons, not property, only prevented from full recognition and enjoyment of their personhood by the state laws that treat them as property. The Constitution then never recognizes slavery as legitimate, even when it recognizes it as legal under the laws of the slave states. In denying legitimacy to slavery, the Constitution recognizes it as an imperfection, as a defect in the system. But it makes no provision to get rid of it. And indeed, it contains many barriers to national action against it. Since slavery is recognized as an institution of the states, the most significant constitutional provision regarding slavery is the provision that isn't there. The Constitution, as we all used to know, establishes a general government of limited and enumerated powers. None of the powers granted to this government in the original Constitution remotely warrant action by the Union against slavery in the states. Slavery within the states is treated as a matter solely for the states themselves to deal with. This acceptance of the existence, if not legitimacy, of slavery in the states speaks against the neo-Lincolnian theory. This was not something that was accepted only reluctantly. It was just taken for granted. Decisive action against slavery or for it was not provided for in the Constitution. Decisive action is deferred and displaced, both in time and place. If such action is to occur, it must occur in the states. Now, many of the founders hoped and expected that such action would be forthcoming, but they did not provide for it. The fact that anti-slavery sentiment was strong, even in many of the states that had many slaves, states like Virginia, and the fact that men like Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, large slaveholders themselves, were thinking up schemes for gradual emancipation within the states, seemed to confirm the possibility that the institution could be eliminated inside the states. So at the Constitutional Convention, Connecticut's Roger Sherman noted, I'm quoting him here, that the abolition of slavery seems to be going on in the U.S., and the good sense of the several states will probably by degrees complete it. Even some delegates from the deep south joined in. Abraham Baldwin of Georgia surmised that his home state, if left to herself, may probably put a stop to this evil. But if slavery was to end in America, it would not be eliminated by the government established by the Constitution. So the fact of facts about, sl about slavery in the Constitution is that it is an institution of the states that have it and is neither established nor legitimated by the Constitution or government of the Union. However, as we have noticed earlier, there are some places in the Constitution where slavery is somehow provided for, where some provision is made to deal with it. There are the Neo-Garrisonian 18 clauses, for example. Now, I'm going to limit myself to the three clauses that the Neo-Lincolnians emphasize and that are very clearly and directly involved with slavery, as opposed to the other 15 clauses of the Neo-Garrisonians. The presence of these three clauses points to the fact that though slavery is an institution of the state's there are some places where it necessarily spills over into the Union. Those are the places touched by our three clauses, places where the Constitution necessarily had to do something about slavery. So I'm going to look briefly again at those three main clauses and see what they do. Now, of the three, the, three, the Fugitive Slave Clause proved over time to be the most controversial. Paul Finkelman, a well-known Neo-Garrisonian, thinks this clause particularly reveals the falsity of the Neo-Lincolnian position because contrary to the Neo-Lincolnians and their way of explaining things about slavery and the Constitution, 
the Southerners at the convention made no threats to take their marbles or their bat and ball and go home if they did not get this protection. Finkelman, as a matter of fact, is quite correct. He is also correct to see that this fact does stand in the way of some aspects of neo-Lincolnian theory. But I'd like to suggest a different interpretation of this clause that does not lead to Finkelman's neo-Garrisonian conclusion. According to the neo-Madisonian way of looking at this, the basic idea of making the constitution was that they were trying to construct a federal union of states with somewhat differential domestic orders. One point of such a union was to have open internal borders to facilitate commerce and other kinds of intercourse among the member states or among citizens of the states. Open borders means that there will of necessity be a certain porousness that make the escape of slaves from slave to free states more possible. The union, in order to be stable, however, should not be perceived by its members to be subversive of their internal order or to be particularly burdensome. One should attempt in making such a union to minimize predictable sources of friction among the members. The open borders and the contiguousness of slave and free states produce likely threats to the harmony among the states. Moreover, since many of the free, new free states had become quite hostile to slavery, they might adopt the very provocative policy of declaring that all persons within their borders were free. Such is the prerogative of sovereign states to declare or to decide on the civil status of people within them. The Fugitive Slave Clause decrees as a matter of friendship or comedy between the states that no state shall have the power to do that, that is to declare escapees free. That is why this clause is located in the part of the constitution that deals with relations among the states. States have a duty not to become a refuge for fugitives, just as under the extradition clause, they have a duty not to become a refuge for escapees from justice from other states. Moreover, and this is perhaps a bit more controversial, the Fugitive Slave Clause contains no grant of power to Congress to enforce it. In my opinion, the best reading of this clause is to say that originally they did not intend a congressional power to enforce the Fugitive Slave Clause. The clause imposes a kind of duty on the states not to attempt to change the legal status of fugitives and indeed to deliver them up, whatever that, uh, however that's to be done but it has no mechanism to enforce this other than the good faith of the states. Now here is another place where history moved off in a different direction from what they were thinking. In 1793, Congress passed a Fugitive Slave Act, which was upheld by the Supreme Court in 1842 in the case known as Prigg versus Pennsylvania. In my opinion, wrongly upheld by the court. If the Fugitive Slave Clause had been left as originally intended, it would not have been as effective an instrument for aiding slavery as it turned out to be. But in light of the potentially disruptive results of leaving some of the states free to undermine uh, the democratic or I'm sorry, the domestic institutions of the other states, it was easy for the convention to adopt the Fugitive Slave Clause, even without the prompting of the threat of disunion. But the clause is not, I would say, meant as a support for slavery. It is rather a support for comedy between the member states in the federal union. The slave trade clause was a different matter. Here's a case where some of the states did indeed make threats about not joining the union if they didn't get their way. The reason why the slave trade clause was important was that under the constitution, Congress would be given the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations. And that power would include the power to regulate the slave trade. So here was a place where, because of a certain power given to Congress, a certain aspect of the institution of slavery was put into the hands of the general government, the government of the union, and something would have to be said about the policy to prevail there. Now the Neo-Garrisonians concede that this was an area, area where threats of disunion were made. 
At the convention, representatives of both South Carolina and Georgia demanded that some provision be made for them to keep the slave trade open. And if not, they claimed they would be compelled not to join the union. General Pinckney of South Carolina insisted, South Carolina and Georgia cannot do without slaves. Another South Carolinian was even more pointed. South Carolina can never receive the plan for a constitution if it prohibits the slave trade. Now, neo Garrisonians believe these states were bluffing. And there were many good reasons, the neo Garrisonians rightly say, why Georgia and South Carolina wanted to be and needed to be parts of the Union. Perhaps it was a bluff. But a factor that we need to keep in mind when we think about that is how people were thinking about the future of America if this effort at making a constitution did not succeed. It was already being said that perhaps one big union of all 13 states was not possible. And that instead of that one big union, maybe three smaller partial unions would be preferable or at least more possible. One, a New England Confederacy, another, a Middle States Confederacy, and third, a Southern States Confederacy. Now this idea disturbed many people. One of the reasons it disturbed them was it because it played into their fears that Britain and other European powers were looking for a way to get a toehold back on this part of the North American continent. If they did that, and if there were different and competing confederacies, then the European powers could bring with them to America the balance of power and great power politics competition that Americans wanted very much to avoid. In the face of the possibility that this union would not include all 13 states, it's perhaps understandable why the convention did not wait to see whether South Carolina and Georgia were bluffing or not, and why they were willing then to accept a 20 year extension of the slave trade for those states and only those states that really insisted on keeping it. Finally, I'd like to turn to the third big clause, the so-called three-fifths clause that deals with taxation and representation. This is probably the clause in the Constitution that has had more nonsense said about it than any other. The usual point is captured in the title of a book, Three-Fifths of a Man, with the point being that counting the slaves as three-fifths was a statement of Americans' estimate of the degree of humanity of the Black people. Now, there are at least two facts that speak against this interpretation. First of all, free Blacks were counted as full persons for purposes of representation. And as the statistics I cited earlier indicate, uh, there were fairly a fair number of free Blacks and that number seemed to be growing. So this was not a racial matter per se. The second fact of significance is that the slave states and the slave owners at the convention were the ones pressing to count the slaves as full persons. And the Northerners who were in the process of getting rid of slavery were the ones who wanted the count to count the slaves for nothing, for zero. This fact is most inconvenient, I think, for the normally circulating account of the meaning of the three-fifths clause. Now the three-fifths formula, in fact, arose under the Articles of Confederation, the pre-existing constitution, and it was part of an attempt to come up with a formula that would allow Congress to calculate how much each state owed into the budget, uh, into the treasury of the US at that time, a budget mainly devoted to offsetting the cost of the Revolutionary War. Now the original plan in the Articles of Confederation was to assess the total wealth of each state and then charge them in proportion to that. I'm not sure how one would exactly do that, be daunting, I think, but imagine trying to do it during a war. After a while, they got the idea that this was not going to work. And so they came up with the idea of using population as a surrogate for total wealth. The idea being in part that human labor, and in this regard, they were good Lockeans, that human labor is the chief source of wealth. But the question then came up, how to count slave labor. Everybody agreed that slave labor was less productive than free labor because people work harder when they get to keep the fruits of their labor. 
than when not. So Southerners thought a slave was only half as productive as a free laborer. Northerners thought slave labor was two thirds as productive as free labor. Remember though, what's at stake here is the amount of taxes each state is going to have to pay. So of course the Southerners try to minimize it and the Northerners try to maximize it. Now the three fifths formula arose as a compromise between one half and two thirds. That is the mysterious origin of three fifths. At the Constitutional Convention, this issue came up because one of the early and most important decisions that they made provided that representation in the lower house, the House of Representatives, would be in proportion to state population. Again, here was a necessary spillover effect of slavery because something would have to be decided about how to count the slave uh, when you counted the population. <clears throat> the idea behind population proportional representation was in part that each state should be represented to a degree that reflected its relative wealth, power, and influence. That is to say, these were many of the same considerations that went into the original formulation of the three-fifths rule under the Articles. After some back and forth, they decided on three-fifths for many of the same reasons that had been decided in the Articles. So in surveying the provisions that directly touch on slavery, what is striking is how few they are and how much they share this one characteristic. They are the places where it was unavoidable that the Constitution take some stand on slavery, build in some power or some policy with regard to the institution of slavery. And when the Constitution dealt with the topic, it was very careful to hold it at arm's length as a matter for and within the states. Otherwise, it stayed away from the topic. This arrangement should, I think, be called an acceptance of a certain sort, not the endorsement of slavery as the Neo-Garrisonians have it, not the rejection that the Neo-Lincolnians say, but an acceptance of the principle that in a federal system, it is a matter up to the member states. It is an acceptance only of a certain sort though, and the embarrassed circumlocutions in the text, the frequent denunciations of slavery as unjust inside and outside the convention show that this was not an acceptance of slavery in the states as a matter of official indifference or neutrality with regard to it. Just to give a sampling of that view, Luther Martin of the slave state in Maryland called for abolishing the slave trade because it was, as he said, inconsistent with the principles of the revolution by which he means the Declaration of Independence. That I think was a widely held view. Slavery is accepted as a state institution, but at the same time regarded as an anomaly and is incompatible with the principles of right endorsed in the revolution and after. Nonetheless, the constitution did a little about this incompatibility. In it, it in effect defers, postpones, or displaces any decision for later and elsewhere. The founding generation acted in the hope that somehow the issue would be taken care of in the future. So my point is that the way in which slavery was treated in the constitution was inevitable or at least nearly so when we understand what the founders were doing as they understood it. The first and really central point is this, in making a constitution, they were making a federation and not a nation they were making a union of otherwise independent states for certain very important, but still limited purposes. The internal ordering of the members of the Federation was not one of the accepted purposes for such unions. And hardly anyone in 1787 thought that that was what was at stake in making the constitution. Almost no one thought that the convention or the union it was making had the power, had the right, had the responsibility to settle questions of the internal ordering of the member states. Abraham Baldwin of Georgia made the point when he intervened in the discussion of the slave trade and said he thought that national objects alone are to be before the convention, not matters such as slavery, which were of a local nature. That in itself made the rest more or less inevitable. Now there were other things. There was a new kind of federalism and a new kind of 
republicanism that the framers were attempting to institute. And these two contributed to the situation of the uh, nature of the federal union as such. But I'm going to skip those because uh, they would take a little more time than we have. Um, so the way that slavery was treated in the constitution was per perfectly in accord with and in a way required by the nature of the task of union making as they understood it and by these two principles that I mentioned briefly, federalism and republicanism. So despite the Neo-Garrisonians 18 or more clauses, slavery was not in fact a central theme at the convention and all of what was done with respect to it was pretty much a side effect of other things that they were doing. That is not to say that they didn't see slavery to be important or that they thought it was insignificant, far from it. But they saw it as a matter for the individual states and not for the union. And as I've tried to suggest in 1787, they at least had some good reason to believe that the states were on a trajectory to abolish this institution that had no place in a free country. Now, if we conclude that the best way to characterize the place of slavery in the constitution and in the convention is in terms of inadvertence, deferral, and avoidance. This is not to deny that the issue played a major role in the travail of the American Republic in later years, and perhaps it could have been predicted to do so. But strikingly, none of the leading men at the time of the founding did so predict. It was not until the crisis over Missouri in 1820 that it became clear that slavery was going to be a major challenge to the constitutional order the reasons why nobody foresaw this should be clear, I think, from what I've said so far and from a number of further considerations. There was first the expectation or the hope that the issue would take care of itself with the growth of enlightenment, liberal values, and humanity within the states. Secondly, the founders thought that they had provided for all of the spillover places in the new order and thus that the issue would not arise again. In this, they were much mistaken. Many more such places arose requiring fresh constitutional level decisions in a much less favorable environment for decision. Questions like the fate of slavery in new territory, the role of the postal service in spreading anti or pro-slavery opinion, the role of free states in relation to the unanticipated efforts to enforce the future slave clause, these and many other largely unprovided for issues arose in the post-founding era and ultimately produced the Civil War. Finally, there was also the novelty of the Federal Republic that they created. It was more of a nation than any previous federation, but it was still thought of as a federal arrangement with limited need for a common moral sensibility. As was said at one point in the convention referring to the Southern slaveholders, let their consciences be their own. That proved not to be possible. As Lincoln said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. The original founders, however, did not think of it as one house, but rather as a subdivision with covered walkways joining the different states or units. The new federalism in time filled in those walkways so that eventually it did feel more like a house than a subdivision. The result was that both the slave and the free states came to demand that the union more unequivocally endorse their vision of moral truth. The political struggle became a struggle for recognition as much as for concrete gains and goods. The original arraignment, arrangement with regard to slavery that is legal but not legitimate became increasingly untenable. Political societies in general tend to work toward consistency between legality and legitimacy, and that proved to be the main storyline for pre-Civil War America. So some, the abolitionists, demanded that the reigning legality be brought into conformity with the notion of legitimacy captured in the idea of a natural rights republic. On the other side were those who tried to redefine legitimacy to match and justify the reigning legal presence of slavery. They rejected the central idea of the natural rights republic, that being the equal endowment of all human beings with natural rights to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. 
Thus, my former home state senator, Indiana, rose on the floor of that body to declare the propositions of the Declaration of Independence to be self-evident lies. So all of this brings us back to Thurgood Marshall and his bicentennial tirade against the founders. As I hope I have made clear, he had a point, though I think not quite as much of a point as he thought. The founders were not all seeing or all wise. Both history and their constitutional order developed in ways that they did not foresee and for which they had not provided well. Yet he ought not to be so harshly dismissive of them. The vision of racial equality and human freedom in the name of which he denounced them is after all, a vision built on their commitment to and their construction of a natural rights republic, a republic where all men are held to be created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. I thank you. Well, <clears throat> almost exactly at 45 minutes. So we have okay, time for uh, questions. Um, I'm going to uh, perhaps abuse the privilege of of my position and ask, what about the Northwest Ordinance being repassed by the first Congress in which Madison served? Yeah. Doesn't that indicate that Congress and the president thought they could direct the formation of future states to be not neutral on the question of slavery and its perpetuation? Doesn't, uh, that, uh, yes. doesn't uh, that point toward, uh, I think you said early in your remarks that the Constitution is not at some precise middle point between the Neo-Gersonian and the Neo-Lincolnian, that the Constitution, mm -hmm. as understood by that early Congress and President, thought of itself as closer to the Neo-Lincolnian or the Lincolnian. Or a better way to, I mean, or another way to put it, I'm not sure it's better, would be to say, um, they agreed with the neo-Lincolnian position that slavery was incompatible with the fundamental moral commitments of the of the of the regime, if you will, um, and that the and that it was not it was not inappropriate to um, attempt to shape uh, future land in that way. Now, one of the things that's different, I think, from their way of thinking about all this, and our way again, another contextual historical contextual factor is that they were not really thinking that America was going to uh, acquire all the territory to the Pacific Ocean and that the US would be this big, great big country. They were thinking mostly of extending to the Mississippi River, which is pretty much what they provided for with the Northwest Ordinance. So it's, uh, it's not as though they had an idea that they were going to swallow up uh, all the rest of the states, all the slave states with, with free states, although that would have been uh, partly the result of what they what they did do, um, but no, I would say yes. It there it's not simply splitting the difference between the two. It agrees with the Lincolnian position in that very very important respect. Floor is open. Sean has got a question in the chat. Michael, can you see that? Or should I read it? Uh, yeah, I can't see it all. all the, I, How does Article 1, Section 10 fit into your view that the Constitution did not seek to regulate the state's affairs in any significant way? The bans on foreign policy, et cetera, fit in with keeping states out of other states' affairs. But what about, for example, limiting ex post facto laws, limiting bills of attainder, limiting or, uh, 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 preserving the obligation of contract, you know, titles of nobility, et cetera. Yeah, um, okay. Uh, it's true that there was some, uh, uh, how should we say, in intervention or injection into the, into the states, but it was actually very minimal. And these were for the most part, um, not, not, not uh, uh, provisions dealing with the substantive character of, the, of what's going on in the internal states, but rather dealing with uh, um, you know, very uh, almost technical legal legal matters, um, ex post facto laws, bills of attainder. This is the the idea being that, um, well, I mean, if we go through them one at a time, uh, an ex post facto law and a bill of attainder were, in their opinion, not true laws. Uh, 
uh, nobility was in uh, titles of nobility was incompatible with the uh, republic that they were trying to establish. Uh, and the question of obligation of contract, that would be the hardest case probably and um, uh, of them reaching into the states more than perhaps would be justified under some notions of um, strict, strict and straight federalism. But I would say in general, Article 1, Section 2 doesn't go very far in qualifying what I, what I said about that. Zach? Zach, Zach uh, I'm sorry, Zach and then Carol. Yeah, Michael, I actually just wanted to, I think, add a couple of, um, a couple of things to Sean's question. Uh, and that is a, a, couple of, uh, a couple of measures that Madison himself wanted. Uh, mm -hmm. So first, the idea of a congressional negative on state laws in, in protection of individual rights. Uh, and then later, his failed amendment to protect the rights of conscience against the state governments um, when he was uh, proposing what eventually became the Bill of Rights. So in Madison's case, it seems like to me that he would at least not have a principled objection to a federal ban on slavery having been included in the Constitution, um, even if that doesn't capture the general, the general consensus of the framers. My, my question is, what do you think about that? Um, whether he thought it was prudential or not, or whether, whether he would have favored mm -hmm. it as a policy measure, um, would Madison have had any principled objection to a simple ban on slavery at the federal level? Well, uh, I mean, I, what, what you point to is the, I, I would say, the um, paradox of my title of labeling the, the constitutional arrangement um, that I am talking about Madisonian or Neo-Madisonian, because Madison was himself perhaps the largest exception to the idea that, that they didn't uh, see the rightfulness of the federal government uh, imposing itself in the in, in within the states, so um, one would have to. What I, I would strongly want to qualify what I, what I you know in another kind of context. Uh, what I'm how much I, I'm attributing this to Madison. M Madison's idea that this is basically a federal system, though, in which the uh, legitimacy of the federal government intervening in the states is is limited, even with uh, even with the uh, negative and the rights of conscience. Um, so it's quite possible. It's an interesting question. I've always dealt, I've always thought about, which is when Madison proposed, and not everybody in the in the in the room may know about this, but Madison proposed at the Constitutional Convention that Congress would have a power to veto any and all laws of the states. Now this was not accepted, which is, by the way, I think in favor of my general reading of the Constitution. Um, but um, the question I have is, well, would Madison have anticipated using that that power to somehow get rid of slavery? And I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but it certainly would have been possible. I mean, in other words, here you have a power that could be conceivably used in that way. So perhaps Madison himself would be the largest exception to the Neo-Madisonian constitution that I'm uh, drawing for you here. Yeah, yeah. Carol, and then I think Aaron, you have your hand okay. up, yes? Um, actually, my question was very similar to Zach's. So, you know, I wanted to understand uh, why this is a Madisonian position. Um, mm. more specifically, so. Yeah, it's just I because I love Madison. So I, think I love Madison so much that I. Yeah, <laughs> so I think you've answered it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My answer will be very similar to Zach's answer too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think Jonah was before me. He got to the chat first. Uh, fine, I think this is Jonah McCoy, is it? I can't Yes, tell. it is, it is. Okay. This is one of our students, uh, Michael, mm -hmm. who you may know. I know Jonah. Yep. I, I ended up taking his class, Dr. Curry. <laughs> yeah. Go right ahead, the floor. Uh, uh, I had to, a question in regards to one of the statements I think is one of the most important pieces of your whole argument that I'm not quite in agreement with, which is that it's you said that the Constitution recognizes the legality of slavery, but it does not grant it legitimacy. Mm -hmm. On that one, I just find I don't think you can separate that, at least, at least within a democratic society, because of the very nature of kind of the basis, especially in a natural a democ uh, republic of natural rights – 
that recognizes the people's right to self-determination and government. You know, it's I was thinking over this in the case of, you know, certainly if this it were a monarchy, you could make a case, I would believe, because then there because then there is a distinct difference between legality and legitimacy. But in a republic where power is derived from the people, if the people have set seen forth to establish the legality of slavery, does that not in and of itself also grant it legitimacy? And then only and thus the withdrawal of the legality is the only way to withdraw legitimacy. So the very recognition and ultimately enshrinement of these of slavery's position, does that not grant it inherent legitimacy as well as legality? Because there's no way to properly separate them. So well, I mean, I, I I'll just appeal to the what the uh, people at the Constitutional Convention said on this, which is they recognize the states have a right to pass these laws, but these are not rightful laws. They, are, they therefore lack legitimacy in the sense of um, being morally right or right according to the principles of political right, but nonetheless, they are laws. This has something to do with the paradoxes of the doctrine of sovereignty, that um, according to the doctrine of sovereignty, states have a, have a right to do what they, what they do, but sometimes they don't do the right when they, when they exercise that right. And that's the distinction between legality and legitimacy that I'm talking about, and that I think we see lots of evidence of in the Constitution itself. For example, in the refusal to use the word slavery to give any sort of uh, legitimacy to it as a, as a, you know, this is okay. If you were to compare the language of the uh, Confederate States con um, Constitution with the U.S. Constitution, I think you'd see a difference. So. Uh, Aaron, then. Great. Uh, thanks for the talk. This is really interesting. And I'm curious, how how does this project fit with or contrast with projects like Adams? Uh, the one that the paper Adam shared last Friday also poses the, the two historical narratives that are dominant in a third way. Mm -hmm. Adams' third way is based on the human freedom approach, but this mm -hmm. third way seems to be based more, more legally, more proper legal historical context. Uh, that's a uh, that, that, that's a good question. I happen to have a lunch meeting with Adam on Wednesday, and we're going to try to <laughs> hash that out. In fact, um, I, I would say it's uh, they share a, a fair amount in common. In fact, um, the one difference that I would emphasize off the top of my head, we'll see if Adam will agree with this, is that Adam's emphasizing freedom per se, and I would emphasize rights mm. as the the, the, the moral foundation, in fact, uh, and, and the freedom is obviously part of that, but it's the rights is the more significant part. But uh, talk, to, talk to me after Wednesday and we'll see what, we'll see <laughs> what comes out of our lunch meeting. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Any other? But Adam, isn't he there somewhere? He could. Uh... I, I don't believe he is. So oh. I'm. Uh... In the moments we have left, the, uh, the historians are not supposed to do this, but the political theorists could do this. What if Madison is presented with the Dred Scott case? What does he say to Tawney's reading of the Declaration and the Constitution on the, on the Neo-Madisonian no. reading of the Constitution, what is Madison's response to Tawney? Okay, so uh, obviously the Dred Scott case raises a lot of different issues, but on the question you particularly mentioned, what is the relation between the Declaration and slavery? Let's say Madison was very, very clear that, sla that uh, slavery is incompatible with the principles of the Declaration and that uh, what Tawney had to say about that. Tawney said in effect, um, the founding generation could not have meant to include the, the uh, blacks in the phrase all men when they talked about all men are created equal and Ma Madison would just not, not accept that simply. But, simply the, but, but the specific constitutional question, could the federal government as in the Northwest ordinance repassed by that first Congress and president, could they limit in the territories could they use the federal power to limit, to declare slavery illegal on American uh, territory? No, right. So Madison, actually Madison and Jefferson both opposed the Missouri Compromise. And in effect, they didn't impose the Northwest Ordinance because Jefferson wrote the Northwest Ordinance and Madison supported it 
at the time of the um, at the at the time when the first Congress repassed it. So, so Madison had no problem with that. He did oppose the Missouri Compromise on the ground that the um, uh, largely on, on a judgment that allowing slavery to um, as long as you could, had no slave trade where you were bringing in fresh slaves to allow the slaves to be spread more thinly through the country would al allow the abolition of slavery more readily. That what they saw was that, or what they feared was that the concentration of slaves in certain areas um, made people fearful about abolition. And therefore, if you spread them more as uh, in the Missouri Compromise, if you spread them around more, um, uh, ab uh, emancipation could conceivably be easier. But that was a that prudential, was a prudential that, that was a prudential judgment, though. Prudential judgment, not saying that per se the Missouri Compromise, to the extent that it said in certain territories there could not be slavery, that was a violation of the Constitution. No, they accepted the Northwest Ordinance as doing that. Well, thank you, Michael. I think okay. we are. At our limit. Obviously, we all know where Michael lives on uh, his email address. So if you have further questions, right, um, okay. please do send them his way. All right. Well, thank you all. Good to see you. Best wishes with it, Michael, getting it as one of 85 chapters. It's going uh, yeah, 85. Oh, yeah. no, condensed, condensed. <laughs> yeah. All right. See you all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Be well.